And we begin in Egypt, where Egypt's interim president has nominated liberal economist Hazim El Beblawi, a former finance minister, as the country's new prime minister on Tuesday. Now, while the liberal opposition chief and Nobel Peace Laureate Mohamed El Baradei was named the vice president for foreign affairs, the appointments come almost a week after the military overthrew Islamist President Mohamed Morsi and chose Chief Justice Adli Mansour to head the Arab world's most populous country. Well, we are bringing you now live pictures from Tahrir Square, where millions are still camped outside Tahrir Square there, despite uh, Mohamed Morsi having been deposed by the army almost uh, six days ago. Well, Egypt's interim leader has laid out a roadmap to the elections in a bid to reassure Egyptians and the world that the country will quickly return to civilian democracy. Adli Mansour wants to rewrite the constitution, elect a new parliament and choose a new president. Well, those are live pictures coming to you from uh, Tahrir Square where millions are still staked out there in Cairo's uh, Tahrir Square. Well, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has called for an independent investigation into Monday's bloodshed in Egypt to be carried out. He has also urged both sides to show restraint and says Egyptian security forces must abide by international standards. At least 51 people have been killed in the recent clashes outside an army base, most of them being supporters of Mohamed Morsi. Now CCTV's Robert Nagila reports. Video footage released by the Egyptian army. Filmed from a helicopter, it purportedly shows pro-Morsi supporters attacking a compound of the Republican Guard. And it was this, according to the military, that prompted troops to defend themselves. We were there to ensure the safety of the people. When we were there, they started firing at us and throwing Molotov cocktails and bricks. Many of my colleagues were hit by the fire, and the proof is here at the hospital. But Morsi supporters have their own footage. This clip shows a man wearing what looks to be a military helmet firing down into protesters. More evidence, according to the protesters, that the army opened fire first. Other more graphic images have been posted online. This is the single bloodiest incident since the turmoil erupted in Egypt, and many people fear there could be more to come. We should undertake to end division and violence on the streets. We need to have elections in the fastest time possible so that by the end of the year we have a president, parliament and a new constitution. We need national reconciliation, although I am not sure how we can achieve that. We already have an isolated president. Interim leader Adli Mansu has ordered a judicial inquiry into the killings. Whether it can be established who fired the first shot is not clear, despite the amount of video footage available. Robert Nagila, CCTV, Nairobi. Well, let's now cross over to CCTV's Adele Makhrui with more on the latest developments there in Egypt. Adele, the interim leader, has appointed a new prime minister. How has this news been received in Cairo? Well, it has been received um, with acceptance from some political parties like the Islamic Noor Party, one of the uh, main leaders in the talks uh, for uh, the new interim uh, transition period. Uh, however, they still have some concerns over the appointment of Al-Baradi as a vice president. But beside that, there is um, sort of a comfort among many of the uh, people in the streets, particularly that they know that there is an economic leader to the interim cabinet, which would take the country out of its deteriorated economy for during the past two years and still is. So uh, they need to feel a little bit safe. They want, however, to see direct impact on them from the new interim government. There is a lot of responsibilities on the government and a short period of time to achieve anything significant, yet people expectations are much higher uh, but from the youth 
powers. They were wishing to see a younger uh, prime minister. They wanted to see more of a fresh blood uh, streaming into the new gov government uh, instead of re repeating the former experiences because Hazim, Dr. Hazim Beblawi uh, was uh, the vice uh, prime minister and the former financial uh, minister f during the interim government uh, led when the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces was leading the country. All right, uh, Adele, now the appointments uh, of the Prime Minister and Mr. El Baradei came, even as the Muslim Brotherhood rejected, you know, th those appointments. Can the interim transition government operate, though, without the Muslim Brotherhood on board? Well, uh, practically they can't. Uh, practically the Muslim Brotherhood is one of the uh, biggest uh, political uh, groups on the ground. Uh, they have been uh, serving people uh, directly or indirectly through uh, personal aid for decades. So they have a very strong influence in the country's politics and they are one of the biggest uh, participator in the political life generally. Even uh, during the former Mubarak regime, they were maybe the only uh, prominent political group apparent to the public, even stronger than the liberal opposition at that time. So uh, their participation is very important to, to have an inclusive transition in the country. Uh, but people are still trying, the Noor party is trying to lead uh, a group of dialogues and discussions with the liberal powers, with media people, try to uh, tune down the a harsh tone from those group against the Muslim Brotherhood so that it aims to make the Muslim Brotherhood accept dialogue but so far it doesn't seem that the dialogue will happen soon we have a brotherhood very keen and determined to keep it an open sit-in even when uh, Ramadan the holy month of Ramadan started uh, but they are still insisting to continue until President Morsi return uh, beside that there has no there has been no achievement in this process and it will affect of course the interim government all right, Adele Mahroui joining us there from Tahrir Square, where millions are still gathered in the square. Well, in the meantime, Tahrir Square has been the center of political turmoil in Egypt for over two years. Tens of rallies have been organized there, and with time, it developed. Today, protests are more fun than before. Our correspondent Adele Mahroui shows us how one simple item could be used for fun or protest. At night, Tahrir Square looks different. The red color of Egypt's flags fades away and a new color becomes dominant. Green. Since June 30th protests, laser beams spread like no time before. I bought the laser so that everyone knows that we are happy, so that they know the people have revolted, not the army. Protesters use the beams for wide reasons. The most common use is for greetings. The greeting technique is very simple. You beam at a laser pointer, and after a short while, they beam back at you. The more beams you have, the more popular you are in Tahrir Square. This is the square's hello. So no wonder the army's helicopters always get the most beams. Lasers are sometimes used to blind specific cameras, usually of channels they don't like. With coordination with someone at home, they test which channel this is. And when they have a confirmation, it's a different party. We point to it on cameras, the media, particularly because we don't like it. They don't deliver the reality here in the square. It supports the brotherhood, so I point at it because I don't want it to film us. If protests turn violent, laser beams become strategic weapons. They would point at an armed opponent to make him a target, to limit his sight, or to warn the team from a threat. The demand is high and that increased the wholesale price for lasers and fireworks. The demand increased because of this revolution. We are here for business. People want to celebrate, so we get it. A lot of it. It's a new trend and people love it. All pointers available for sale are made in China. Their wholesale starts from $10 each. Consumers get them for $13. They vary according to performance and could reach $100. US dollars. Expensive to most Egyptians, yet still spreading. Adel Mahroui, CCTV, Cairo.
and we'll continue following the developments in Egypt for you. But still ahead on this program. Two years of independence, we evaluate South Sudan's progress since its break from Sudan. And the Mara Wanda, the latest from this season's wildebeest migrations. Watching Africa Live on CCTV News with me, Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi. Now it is exactly two years since South Sudan declared its independence from Sudan and became the world's newest nation. South Sudanese citizens across the world held different events to commemorate the special day. In Kenya's capital, Nairobi, hundreds of South Sudanese nationals gathered to celebrate and reflect on their country's progress so far. Many say their country still has a long way to go in economic development. CCTV's Kofa Murenje tells us more. Kenya has been home to thousands of South Sudanese nationals for many years. This Tuesday, though hundreds of miles from home, they joined the rest of their countrymen in celebrating two years of their country's independence. Memories are still fresh for some of those who fought for independence. Bush has taught us a lot of things. It has taught, up, taught us that you can keep yourself. It has taught, taught us that you can lead yourself. It can also taught us that you can manage yourself before you manage somebody. However, two years down the line, Africa's youngest nation is still struggling to get systems up and running. You have challenges of providing services, you have challenges of construction, but the government is committed. The government is committed to address some of this issue so that the citizen recoup the, 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 the benefit of being independent. South Sudan is very young, it's like a small child. So the small child, when he's working, he has to face the difficulties. Difficulties of working, difficulties of eating, difficulties of talking, Difficulties, and, uh, difficulties of making relationship, these are the things that the, 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 the small child can face. Indeed, though at a low pace, things have been changing gradually in South Sudan for the past two years. Many, especially the youth, believe with time they can also make a difference in their country. Rome is never built in one day, so it, it is a journey. And history has it that... Uh, uh, it is not those who begin the race, but those who finish the race. So we believe we have the responsibility at the moment. The road has not been smooth for Africa's youngest nation. Issues of insecurity, border disputes and oil transportation have always threatened to plunge Khartoum and Juba back into chaos. But however, many here are optimistic that South Sudan will catch up with the rest of other African countries in due time. The issue of security between the two countries issue of the borders have been addressed in the September 27 um, uh, cooperation agreement between the two countries that was broken by the African Union. It is our hope that all this, uh, the agreement will be implemented to the latter. South Sudan has rich oil deposits, but the lack of a pipeline to transport its crude oil to Sudan's Port Sudan has always been the cause of friction between the two countries. The demarcation of the borders between the two countries has been a source of conflict for years. Oh, Kofam Renje, CCTV, Nairobi.
Let's now get an analysis on South Sudan's progress so far. And we are joined in studio by Mr. John Gashie. Mr. Gashie, thank you very much for joining us here. We've seen the celebrations there by South Sudanese nationals living in Kenya. And there have been a lot of celebrations across the world. Two years down the line, though, after South Sudan's independence, what's there to celebrate? There's a lot, Beatrice. Uh, one is that South Sudan has held. Uh, I think... Uh, after independence, there were all sorts of issues about whether Sudan will hold, South Sudan itself. And uh, they've held despite and in spite a lot of, you know, internal political contradictions, violence, and of course, uh, issues to do with their relations with the neighboring countries, especially Sudan. Uh, that they've held and that they've, they've managed to push the envelope further. So there's a lot to celebrate, that they're not um, looking behind their shoulders, so to speak. There, there is a, a lot to celebrate, but still there has been tension uh, characterized over the last two years between mm -hmm. South Sudan and its neighbor, as you put it, Sudan. What's been the main cause of this? What is the cause of all that tension? I, I, I would ca characterize the tension to be perhaps a carryover from the unfinished business of the CPA and perhaps also a historical context about the uh, old grudges, political grudges, so to speak. And then, of course, there, are, there is the, the more current issue of um, uh, both countries trying to gain advantage, so to speak, and suspicion. So the cause of this is more of a combination of past, current, and present hostilities and suspicion. And I think they haven't managed, for both countries, politically have not managed to perhaps leave behind their, their history. It is also perhaps characterized by internal contradictions, both in, in the South and in the North. And this has more to do perhaps with uh, the political leadership in both countries trying to uh, you know, explain a way, so to speak, the splitting of of, this, of the Sudan. Then. Are they able, though, to leave that, uh, those historical disagreements behind, do you think? Yes, but I think so far we have this residual uh, suspicion and I think it's, it's a question of both countries, the leadership uh, with the assistance of the international community trying to uh, negotiate and manage and uh, the, the, the manage this transition. It's informed by uh, um, uh, historical injustices, right. it is informed by current political jostling both within uh, South Sudan and in the north, uh, in, in Sudan, the old Sudan then. And then it's also perhaps informed by competition for economic, social and political uh, uh, resources. And I think uh, we have to give credit that both countries, the leadership, despite the, the, the attempts to pull them back, they've managed to kind right. of find uh, a working relationship. So they, they are able to find a working relationship. But when you travel around mm. South Sudan, though, mm -hmm. can you see any visible changes to that country? Mm -hmm. the, vis the first thing you notice in South Sudan is that uh, South Sudan is that the people of South Sudan are not, as they were in the past, looking behind their shoulders. There is a semblance of um, uh, safety in. Uh, if you were to compare it five years, two years, right. and three years ago. So there is, and then perhaps most fundamental, as you would see, is the hope. There is a hope that there, there wasn't five years, two years ago. Now there is a hope that we are our masters, our own masters, we can chart a way forward. Having said that, of course, the peace dividend hasn't been as that, um, uh, uh, what shall I say, remarkable or right. as you know, uh, um, the benefits have not been that uh, clear. But I would say five years ago, the people I see, the faces you see, uh, the children, the laughter, even though it's, there's still a long way to go, it, there's a lot that has changed psychologically, politically. Now, socially and economically, they Very might briefly. Not, Yes. Socially and economically, there might not be that much to perhaps, uh, you know, write home about, but politically and uh, 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 psychologically, there is a lot of movement. 
I think... Um, All right, Mr. John Gashir, mm. we're going to leave it there for mm -hmm. the moment. But thank you very much for your insights on uh, South Sudan and uh, South Sudan celebrations today. We'll take another short break here on Africa Live, but still ahead on the program. The Mara Wanda, the latest from this season's wildebeest migration. Make major investments in China. In China, grab the same. Why we are living for? That's a fundamental My government. position on China is a must. By our leaders, at last, at day, I think men for standards will be hard. Have a dialogue. Political change and human rights. Strong as we are. Don't you think you change the human rights of this place? Ideas matter. Former South African President Nelson Mandela is still in critical but stable condition, according to the presidency. President Jacob Zuma thanked the public and the international community for their ongoing support and prayers. Mandela is receiving treatment for a lung infection at the Pretoria Heart Hospital. In the meantime, family members of Nelson Mandela were seen arriving at the hospital Tuesday. Madiba's ex-wife, Winnie Madikizela Mandela, his eldest daughter, Makaziwe, and two grandchildren were seen at the hospital. Mandela is entering his fifth week at the hospital. His health has become a concern to South Africa's 53 million people, for whom Mandela remains a potent symbol of struggle against apartheid. A car blast targeting government forces has left two soldiers dead, injured, I beg your pardon, in Mogadishu's Bakara market. Gunfire ensued shortly after the blast. Witnesses confirmed that a hand grenade was hurled at the government's vehicle as it passed through the busy marketplace. Bakara market has been one of the strongholds of the Al-Shabaab militant groups and there are suspicions that the vast district might still be a hiding place for the Islamists. Somali government officials have not yet commented on the incident. Now, a large herd of wildebeest and zebras have begun to cross the Mara River in Kenya's Mara National Reserve. However, zebras crossing the river are a rare sight, and CCTV was lucky enough to catch the elusive animals making their way past the dangerous predators. CCTV's Carol Oyola tells us more. The Mara River, the highlight of the world wonder, the wildebeest migration. Every year, tourists flock the reserve to catch a glimpse of the wildebeest cross the crocodile-infested river. But one animal always remains elusive, the zebra. And this time, CCTV was lucky to catch the zebras make their way across the river. The zebras and wildebeest are from Tanzania, crossing into Kenya for greener pastures. The Mara River is their biggest hurdle, not because of the somewhat deep waters, but the dangerous and hard-to-sport crocodile. The zebras, confident that the waters are clear, begin to make their way across the river. Some wildebeest join them, but the predators are not far off. They closely watch their prey, waiting for the right time to strike. The younger animals are the ones at risk, and some are not so lucky. The reason why they are crossing the river and going back Actually, we can say that they are going for the young ones back. This is a feast for the crocodiles who fight to get a piece. The migration is an endless search for food and water as wildebeest and zebras circle the Serengeti Mara ecosystem. Carol Oyola, CCTV. 
Well, film buffs from around the world have been gathering in Zanzibar to see some of the best movies out of Africa and beyond. The Zanzibar International Film Festival is a nine-day extravaganza of film, music and the arts. CCTV's Maria Galang is there and filed this report. For movie fans, it doesn't get much better than this. Nine days out of the office, hundreds of screenings to choose from, concerts too, and all of it set on an exotic island. The Zanzibar International Film Festival, or Tamasha, as it's popularly known as here on the island, is now in its 16th edition. The rich history and culture of Zanzibar enhances this experience, with spectators treated to screenings at this open-air amphitheater. The festival is also a competition, East Africa's version of the Oscars. And this year, there was a big jump in the number of submissions. We, we had a great response. Uh, in terms of the number of the films we received, we received about uh, 257 films and, and as you know we cannot screen all of the films, they're very, uh, they're very beautiful films but we only selected about 80. The show not only attracts the cream of the movie making industry but also tourists. More than 200,000 this year alone providing a much needed boost for the local economy. As, as you can see, for about 16 years, ZIF is bringing a lot of guests that are coming, people that are coming from out, foreigners, the tourists, that are coming to visit the island at the same time when ZIF is happening. So ZIF become a reason for them to travel to come. This is my first time and it's uh, been absolutely wonderful. Very well put together. So I think it's a great opportunity to see how cinema is like really growing in Africa so it's it's been wonderful and just meeting people from around the world it's good yeah I would definitely come again um, I've had a great time I've learned a lot and there's been loads of other things going on as well like the workshops I'd wish I, I'd known about the workshops I would try to go on one of those they've been great and there's been a nice selection of music as well the festival provides a valuable platform for local filmmakers and actors to share their experience with foreign counterparts. But more than that, it's a unique opportunity to show moviegoers from around the world just what they're missing. Maria Galang, CCTV, Zanzibar.